Welcome to the presentation for Nursing 150. This presentation is uh, regarding Module 10. Module 10 um, discussing peripheral vascular diseases. Peripheral vascular disease consists of two distinct types of disorders, arterial and venous disease. This presentation specifically will talk about arterial disease, so peripheral arterial disease, also known as PAD. Most peripheral vascular disorders of the arteries are a consequence of arteriosclerosis, um, which is the thickening of the hard or hardening of the arterial wall. This impedes circulation from the heart to the lower extremities. So the blood flow from the heart to the extremities is um, blocked and the extremities do not get adequate blood flow. This can cause ischemia of the muscles in the lower extremity. Peripheral arterial disease is also caused by atherosclerosis. The atherosclerotic plaque obstructs optimal blood flow to the muscles of the lower extremity. With the increased muscle activity, there's an increased need for arterial blood flow. For this reason, during ambulation or exercise, um, limitations of the arterial blood flow can cause muscle pain due to the ischemia. It's much like angina and chest pain when um, we were talking about the coronary arteries having atherosclerosis in them and causing a decreased blood flow to the muscle. It's the same situation in the peripheral muscles. The presence of arteriosclerotic plaque within the lower extremities is accelerated by the presence of diabetes. Hyperglycemia and diabetes causes endothelial injury damaging the arterial vessels. This is just a review of the things, the way that we can assess a patient for having risk factors for atherosclerosis. Remember those cholesterol, cholesterol, high cholesterol levels, um, especially LDL levels, would put a person at risk because remember the LDL cholesterol is the type of cholesterol that takes the um, fat um, to the vessels and causes the formation of the plaque in the arterial wall. Homocysteine levels are thought to be possibly uh, an indicator that someone is at higher risk for developing an atherosclerosis. Um, and there, it's a bit controversial yet, but it's, it's thought if a person has signs and symptoms and they have a high cholesterol level and they have a high homocysteine level that they're at higher risk for developing atherosclerosis. And remember the assessment of the nutrition status of a patient, you know, asking them the kind of foods they eat. If they eat a lot of fatty fried foods, that could put them at risk. Also, any drug therapy, um, are they on any kind of um, medications, any diabetic medication, are they compliant with it, are they on cholesterol medications, um, things like that. Of course, smoking is a risk factor. That's just as we're just reviewing these risk factors, we have to mention that. Um, and then exercise, are they very active? Do they have a sedentary lifestyle? Um, and of course, any sedentary lifestyle would lead to the formation of atherosclerosis. It could. Um, any complementary and alternative therapies? Have they, you know, are they doing any kind of natural therapies? Um, you know, what other kinds of things um, do they have in their past medical history that we would need to know about to assess a patient? I just wanted to bring these drugs up again. These are medications that can lower cholesterol levels in patients who are unable to control it with diet and exercise. Um, if somebody, just remember, you know, it's one of the major things that can lead to atherosclerosis, which can lead to um, peripheral arterial disease, uh, just as it can lead to um, coronary artery disease. It's the same, same pathophysiology um, here. So I just wanted to kind of review this. And we have those medications, those statin medications that we could put a patient on if they are unable to get their cholesterol levels lower with just diet and exercise. Statins um, do come with some 
side effects. They can cause damage to the liver because that's how the metabolism occurs from statins. So we have to make sure we monitor their liver function. It also can cause an acute um, damage to the muscle, like, like almost like a lactic acidosis. So the patient needs to report any sudden onset of acute uh, muscle pain. There's a couple other meds that we have. The um, fibrinic acids, it's another classification that we could utilize. Um, that is phenofibrate and gem fibrazil. Um, these meds are highly uh, effective in decreasing triglyceride levels and increasing HDL. They're not effective for lowering LDL levels. So it would be more appropriate for people who have like low LDL or low HDL levels and normal LDL levels and high triglycerides. So that's kind of how they're chosen as to what medication that we put them on. Zetia is a new medication as a Tamib. That's a medication that we utilize. It actually um decreases the absorption of cholesterol from the diet. So that's somebody that um, is uh, getting their other high cholesterol is due to um, eating a lot of fats in their diet. So if they're unable to change that and get their change their diet enough to get their cholesterol levels down, Zetia would be an appropriate medication. It's often used in conjunction with a statin sometimes in patients who the statin alone can't get the cholesterol levels down, they'll add the ezetimibe, which is the Zetia. It's important that these patients um, take these. They shouldn't drink alcohol, um, you know, excessive amounts of alcohol due to the fact that it can cause the liver upset. And also, they it's thought to be more um, effective if they take it at night due to the fact that our bodies naturally make cholesterol at night. So if they take the medication at night, it should um, decrease the production of the LDL cholesterol. That's the hope of it. So this is just kind of a summary of what I said in the first couple of slides about peripheral arterial disease. It's basically the atherosclerosis of the peripheral arteries. In module nine, we talked about the coronary arteries um, in this module, we're just going to talk about the peripheral arteries. So it's the arteries that take the blood flow, the oxygenated blood to the body, to the organs, to the limbs, to the periphery. Um, these can also get atherosclerosis, which can cause um, a decrease in the blood flow to the lower extremities and cause ischemic pain that is um, very similar to angina, like chest pain. Um, they start to get ischemic um, pain, especially with increased activity due to, it's again, a supply and demand of oxygen imbalance when, uh, when able, whenever the muscle needs more oxygen, but the body is unable to get the oxygenated blood to the area due to the fact that there's not a good patent artery to get the blood flow there. These are just some of the risk factors, and they are the same risk factors for atherosclerosis. So whatever causes atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries also can occur in the peripheral arteries. Common risk factors, just to review, is that hypertension, that high lipid level, which is high cholesterol, diabetes, cigarette smoking, obesity, and familial predisposition. Um, and of course, as we get older, that puts a patient at risk for developing atherosclerosis as well. Um, and if someone has some peripheral arterial disease, they're more than likely have some coronary artery disease, so they're more likely to have complications such as chronic angina, MI, or a stroke. These are the key factors, the key um, signs and symptoms and stages of chronic peripheral arterial disease. Initially, um, the patient, and that's, remember, some of those pictures that we looked at, and I think I have a few in this presentation as well, this is when the plaque is just getting in the lining of the arterial wall and slightly narrowing the lumen of the artery. Um, this is when it might kind of decrease the pulses a little bit, maybe. Um, so if there's a blockage in the popliteal artery, um, 
then maybe that pulse is going to be a little bit decreased than it was before. But the patient doesn't typically have any signs and symptoms as far as physical complaints yet. A brie or an aneurysm may be present. A brie is that swishing sound that you hear. Um, when you hear like a change in the blood flow, something that's altering the blood flow through the artery. And that aneurysm is a weakening of the arterial wall. And we'll talk a little bit more specifically about aneurysms, but essentially that's what it is. It's when there's some kind of in injury or weakening in the arterial wall that's an aneurysm. Moving on to stage two is, is the um, signs and symptoms of claudication. That's when your patient begins to get some of that muscle pain and cramping, or what I say, angina, um, with exercise to that peripheral extremity that occurs with exercise and is relieved at rest. It's, this is sort of similar to what we talked about in Module 9 is your stable angina, when they kind of get a little bit of cramping um, with exercise and is relieved by rest. In the case of peripheral arterial disease, this muscle pain and cramping is known as intermittent claudication. Usually they can walk only a certain distance before cramping, burning, muscle discomfort um, forces them to stop, and then the pain stops after rest. This is a pretty um, classic sign of stage 2 uh, peripheral arterial disease. In stage 3, it becomes worse. The pain is... Um, associated with resting or exercise. So it's sort of becoming that unstable angina now. Now it's pain while resting. It commonly wakes the patient at night. It's described, then they begin to have some numbness and burning and a toothache type pain to their extremity. It usually begins in the distal, the most distal portion, because that's the area that's getting the, the least amount of blood flow. So if it is like a, a leg, then the toes and the foot is what begins to have um, the pain first. And it's rarely in the calf or ankle. It's usually in the, in the most distal portion. Um, and then pain is relieved by placing the extremity in the dependent position. These are those patients that want to sleep with their leg hanging off the side of the bed. Um, and that's because they're trying to get that blood flow down. They're trying to like, it, 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 your just body just naturally wants to get the blood flow down there. So it's trying to help to have gravity to, um, to help that. Stage four of chronic peripheral arterial disease is when the artery, artery is very, very um, occluded with atherosclerosis. So the patient will begin to show signs of ischemia and necrotic damage. And remember, that's like, you know, if, if an area of your body is deprived of oxygen, it will become darkened, it will become um, cold, painful, um, and then it can actually get gangrene. Gangrene is just an infection that's due to the lack of nutrients and per blood flow to the area. These are just some pictures to have a visual reminder of kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about peripheral arteries. Um, these are all the normal arteries here, all the arteries that you have in your lower extremities, and these are the arteries that we're talking about with peripheral arterial disease. Um, and then this is just, again, kind of the comparing comparison of the atherosclerosis that's in the coronary artery, and then it's the very same thing that occurs in a peripheral artery here it's happening in this this leg here, one of the superficial femoral arteries, or it looks like the pop of the teal actually. So this area here is going to be, when it's narrowed as this one is, this lower portion of the patient is going to have to be deprived of oxygen. They'll begin to have pain in the lower most distal area in the feet and the toes. Um, if it becomes very, very narrowed and there's very poor blood flow down to the extremity and the patient doesn't do any kind of interventions to um, stop this continued blockage or to promote uh, blood flow to the area. They could start to get necrosis in their toes. Um, I have some pictures that show um, what an arterial ulcer looks like and that's due to the lack of blood flow. The tissue will begin to die. As it dies, it's, it um, can become gangrenous because of the, um, it's basically just dead tissue.
Some of the signs and symptoms of peripheral arterial disease is hair loss, um, a scaly, pale, or mottled skin, thickened toenails. Uh, I think I have some pictures of that, and there's some good pictures of your book of arterial disease. The main thing is to become familiar with what arterial disease looks like and what venous disease looks like. Because remember, veins take blood back up to the heart, so they look different. There, is, there can be some venous disease, um, but it looks different than arterial. There's, um, there's some tables in your book that kind of compare and contrast. Um, and usually the big thing with the arterial issues is the hair loss, the pale or mottled skin. Um, also, uh, the extremities become gray, darkened, pale. There's a dependent ruber, which is um, basically when the patient hangs their foot dependent, it becomes this, it's, it's more than just like a redness. It almost looks like an infected redness. And that's just due to um, the poor tissue perfusion and um, the body trying to compensate and get blood flow down there. The patient will start to have like numbness um, and tingling. It's almost like, kind of like when your foot falls asleep, you get that weird numbness and tingling. And that's because like if you sat on your foot or something, you've blocked the blood flow to it. Um, and change in positioning for these patients can cause that, um, that weird dependent ruber if they like said they've had their foot up and now they put it down it might um, get a little bit of an increased blood flow to the area and they get that weird sensation when the blood's returning back to the area. The other thing is um, patients who have arterial disease want to lay their keep their foot dangling. Um, that's not the ideal it's the most comfortable way for them to do it but ideally they want to kind of put their feet up the important thing is that they can um, elevate it, but they do not want to elevate it above the level of their heart because then it won't get any blood flow at all. So they have to be very careful about how to elevate that extremity if it's a peripheral arterial disease, which is just the opposite with venous disease. And that's why I think it's important to make sure that you understand that there is a difference. And you need to be able to recognize the signs of each one that way you know how to treat it because they are treated a little bit differently. Diagnostic tests to diagnose prefer arterial disease are mostly non-invasive and pretty easy to do. A Doppler probe is um, probably one of the most um, non-invasive. Basically they'll do like almost like an ultrasound and they can do segmental systolic blood pressure measurements of the lower extremities. So basically what they're doing is they're taking like the pressures um, and the, you know, cause all of our arteries have pressure so they can tell if they're high, um, if they're higher in one area and lower in another area that can kind of tell them if there's a blockage in a certain area. The specific test uh, also known as the ankle brachial index test. Um, basically it's kind of taking blood pressures, taking like a brachial blood pressure and an ankle pressure, blood pressure, and then they compare. An ABI of less than 0 0.9 in either leg is diagnostic of PAD. So basically it's the, um, the value is derived by dividing the ankle blood pressure by the brachial blood pressure. So um, it just kind of, it's like a comparison of what it is. And here's, a, there's a picture of what they're doing here. Um, and how they compare it. That's just a real easy, non-invasive test, cheap test that we can do to help diagnose peripheral arterial disease. Plasmography is kind of like um, just hooking up and getting some measurements or tracings of the arterial flow. So um, it's kind of like these tracings of how much there's uh, the, the waveform of the artery it's causing when it pumps the blood. So if the occlusion is present, the waveforms are decreased to flatten depending on the degree of occlusion. So again, a, a easy, quick diagnostic test. Um, and really there's no prep for these. They can eat, they can drink, there's no sedation. It's basically just taking special blood pressures. So, so nursing management, 
of a patient who has peripheral arterial disease once we've decided that that's their diagnosis. Exercise and positioning, and, and there's specific ways of doing exercise and positioning. Um, exercise can improve arterial blood flow. Of course, we know that exercise is always good. It helps our blood flow. Um, and then positioning is referring to helping the, the patient um, position their extremity to um, create the best um, blood flow to the area. They don't want to keep, they always, they, a lot of times they want to leave their extremity dangling, but it's, they really should um, kind of move it around. And elevating it is um, controversial. You have to be very careful because we don't want them, the bottom line is we don't want them to raise their leg above their heart level um, because that's, that goes against gravity and that's going to um, make it even harder for the, the heart to pump blood to that extremity if it's up higher. Sometimes patients have swelling with their um, peripheral arterial disease, um, especially because people can have both. They can have arterial and they can have venous um, issues. So sometimes they'll have swelling. So it is important to kind of elevate their legs, but just don't put it above their heart, the level of their heart. Promoting vasodilation. So that, that means dilating the vessel so that it gets blood flow a little bit. Um, this is um, done by like keeping the environment warm. They should avoid being in cold weather because your your vessels constrict um, when you're in cold weather or you're in cold rooms um, or in a cold environment. So try to keep the environment as warm as possible. One thing to be careful about, the patient um, can have decreased um, ability to feel adequately to have sensation because they have numbness sometimes so they should not be putting any kind of a um, like a heating pad on those extremities for heat because they're going to burn themselves they, they might you know end up burning themselves because they um, can't feel how hot it is so it's better if they just kind of try to keep the, the entire environment warm and stay out of the cold. They shouldn't be out in cold temperatures for long periods of time. And always drink adequate fluids to make sure that their blood, that thins your blood a little bit to make sure you have an adequate amount of fluids on board. So that's always important to increase fluids. Avoid emotional stress, caffeine, and nicotine. They should stop smoking if, if at all possible um, because that's going to help promote better blood flow. Nicotine also vasoconstricts, so it's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be difficult to get that blood flow to that extremity if they're smoking and the, the vessels are being vasoconstricted. The two medications listed here are antiplatelet agents. We talked about those in the coronary artery disease. They work the same way with the peripheral arteries. They keep the platelets from sticking together and forming a clot, which will completely occlude the, the artery. Uh, clopidogrel is a pretty safe drug. You do have to, I mean, it can make your patient um, be more at risk of bleeding, like if they have an injury, if they fall or something like that, they might bleed a little bit more than normal. So you just have to tell them to keep an eye out for any signs of excessive amount of bleeding uh, and things like that. Here's a few more pictures of peripheral arterial disease. Um, as you can see here, this is the buildup of the fatty substances in the wall of the artery um, that's decreasing the blood flow to the peripheral part of the extremity here. Um, and so the treatment the surgical treatment for peripheral arterial disease is very similar to the coronary artery disease. Basically, we can go in percutaneously. Remember, percutaneous means to um, insert a, to puncture the vessel from the outside. So it's a percutaneous, so we would, they would again go to the cath lab and they would get um, the femoral, they might go through the femoral artery and take a guide wire down and um, place a stent or an angioplasty. Um, they could balloon that plaque or they could uh, put a stent in to move that plaque out of the way and, and open up that blood flow, open up that artery that's diseased. Our, 
arteriectomy would be that they might um, remove the clot. They might be able to pull the clot out with the guide wire. Remember, post-procedure, if we have um, cannulated their femoral artery, they're going to have to watch the site for any bleeding. They're going to have to have some activity restriction. They will have to lay um, flat and not move their extremities for um, for a while post procedure, just so that we can keep an eye on that femoral artery and make sure that it doesn't bleed. Um, we'll also definitely you got to monitor that affected limb. Which one? If they just put a stent in the right leg, then you got to keep an eye on the circulation and make sure that that stent or the plasty doesn't fail. So that means you got to watch for any sudden decrease in your pulses, any um, sudden coolness, pain um, of that extremity. Um, so just be very careful. A complication is this is this is an acute peripheral occlu arterial occlusion, which would mean that some, maybe a clot somehow slipped off and completely occludes the area and that would be a sudden onset of pain and um, a loss of the pulse to the um, to distal to that area that was affected. And we'll talk about that in the next few slides when we talk about acute peripheral arterial occlusion. This is another procedure that can be done. Remember like when we talked in module 9 about coronary artery bypass grafting? The similar type of a surgery can be done on a patient with a peripheral arterial disease. Basically, we can harvest um, some a vein from another area of the body, or in this case, they've actually used a graft that is man-made, and they can sew it um, somewhere above the area that is occluded, and then sew it down below in order, and they'll bypass the total blockage here, and they can return blood flow. That's in a person who has some kind of a blockage that we can't fix with a stent or an angioplasty or an arterectomy. So um, there's several different areas where this could be done. This is just another picture to show how that would work. And that's a aor aortoiliac and aortofemoral bypass is what that's called. Again, post-procedure, you are monitoring that extremity that is distal to where the procedure was performed, make sure that they continue to have blood flow. If they suddenly lose blood flow, they'll think about what that looks like. Um, they'll have a sudden loss, uh, a sudden loss of pulses, sudden pain, and it's a lot of the six P's. Remember the six P's that we talked about? Um, back when we talked about mobility and somebody having a cast on, if a cast is too tight, it decreases the blood flow to the extremity. So again, you're looking for the six P's very closely post a procedure like this to make sure that they uh, maintain blood flow. And again, they're going to have some restricted activity as well. So this slide is covering that acute peripheral arterial occlusion um, that I spoke about. And this could happen post these procedures. It could happen um, after they do an, a, a plasty or a stent to one of the one of the lower extremities or if they do that bypass which can mean an embolus could somehow um, which is a clot that has moved from somewhere else in the body or um, from some other source and moved to another area and, and clotted the artery. It can affect the upper extremities are the most common in the lower extremities. This this would be an indication for the use of a thrombolytic therapy, which is a medication that can be given IV to basically what we, the nickname that thrombolytic therapy um, has is clot busters. So these meds do break up a clot. Remember we talked about all the different classifications of um, anticoagulants. Heparin doesn't break up clots, it prevents any further clotting from happening. So this medication, which is Activase or Altaplace, also known as TPA, these medications actually break up clots. They have lots and lots of contraindications. Um, I know that they're listed in your book, Thrombolytic thromb thromb Therapy does have lots of um, contraindications. If anybody's had a, a recent history of any kind of surgery, 
that would be a contraindication because they're going to be at high, high risk for bleeding. So only, you know, it has to be used very cautiously, these medica medications can, um, because, again, they put a patient at high risk for bleeding. So, um, and there's a nursing alert in your book. When thrombolytics are given, assess for signs of bleeding, bruising, or hematoma. So just keep a close eye on them. But it can be an effective medication that's given IV to bust up clots. Some of you might have seen something um, put into a, usually a pick line is what we put um, out to place in. Sometimes a pick line, which is a peripherally inserted central catheter in a patient. Um, it's just kind of a central line that's put in the upper arm. If it clots off, if the lumen of that um, catheter clots off, we will sometimes instill a small amount of altoplace in it in hopes of busting up the clot that's in that line so that we can continue to use it. Usually what they do is they instill it in the line and they leave it in there for about 30 minutes and then they pull it back out. So the patient shouldn't get any of the um, any of the medication because it should just sit in the line and not go to the patient. Um, so those are a couple of different uses for thrombolytics. The biggest problem with thrombolytics is it can put a patient at risk for bleeding. So anybody who's had a big surgery in the past couple months, anybody that's had a stroke in the past couple months cannot have it. Um, so there are some contraindications. Surgical therapy would be if you had to, if somebody has an acute embolus um, going to in an artery going to a peripheral extremity, they would, might have to go in and do a thrombectomy, which is actually go in and pull that that clot out um, because basically it's again you know this would be like a heart attack of the leg that acute occlusion. So, um, you know, if that occlusion is left there, then the limb will die. So um, it's important to get that, that embolus out of there, which might be a surgical technique where they go in and actually um, do like an arteriotomy and, and pull that, that clot out of there. Nursing care post-procedure or post-treatment. Monitor that patient if it's just the thrombolytic. You got to monitor them for signs and symptoms of bleeding. You got you want to avoid sticking them or doing any invasive procedures for at least 24 hours until the drug um, is wearing off. And then also if it's a surgical procedure like a thrombectomy for this acute peripheral arterial occlusion, then you're going to monitor to make sure that the they don't get reoccluded. Again, you're monitoring the circulation. Um, you're doing the six P's of that extremity. Just a reminder of the six P's. Um, pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, paralysis, par paralysis, and poikilothermia, which is coolness. Those are the things that you're looking for in people who have had any kind of procedure of their peripheral arteries. Um, make sure that you monitor for this to make sure that they maintain blood flow. So another disorder that can occur in an Artery is an aneurysm. Aortic aneurysm is referring to an aneurysm of the aorta. Remember the aorta comes off the left ventricle of the heart and then it comes around and becomes the um, thoracic aorta and then comes down further and becomes the, the abdominal aorta. Um, and so this is referring to an aneurysm that can occur anywhere in that aorta. An aneurysm is a permanent localized dilation of an artery, which enlarges the artery. Um, it can enlarge the diameter at least two times its normal diameter. There are different terms that can be used to describe the type of aneurysm it is. Fusiform means that it's a diffuse dilation affecting the entire circumference of the artery. So it would be this dilation of the entire circumference. And then the saccular is an outpatching affecting only a small portion. So it might be the arteries coming down here and then you have like a small portion on one side of it. That's a saccular one. Dissecting aneurysms. Um, 
differ from aneurysms in that they are formed when blood accumulates in the wall of an artery. So this can happen like if there's an injury in the arterial wall and that allows blood flow. So if the blood's coming through here and then there's an injury that allows blood flow to come in, it can begin to get within that wall there and it can cause a bulge. Um, so that's a dissection. And I've already spoke about the abdominal aorta and the thoracic aorta. The abdominal aortic aneurysm is just referring to an aneurysm in the aortic in the abdominal piece of it. And the thoracic abdominal aneurysm is just referring to an aneurysm in the thoracic piece up by the heart. Causes of aneurysms, atherosclerosis, again, is the most common cause. And um, again, it's that buildup and damage of the arterial wall that can cause the bulging and the weakening in it. Same, same contributing factors. This makes it easy. Same, same thing can cause aneurysms that cause coronary artery disease. It's the same that causes peripheral arterial disease. Um, age, gender, and family history also make you more at risk for it. Hypertension is um, prolonged hypertension that's untreated is one of the major things that can really begin to cause aneurysms. It can weaken that arterial wall. That increased pressure, constant pressure, along with a damaged arterial wall caused by atherosclerosis can put a patient at risk for aneurysms. Here's some better pictures than the one that I drew. Again, just showing you um, the different types of aneurysms that occur. And usually that's what happens when somebody is diagnosed with an aneurysm. They just sort of try to define what kind it is and that can define treatment. The other thing is that it has to be so big in order to require treatment. Um, if it's just small, a detectable aneurysm is at least five centimeter, centimeter in diameter. Um, it's usually not until it becomes greater than seven and it depends on the doctor and the patient. Um, but usually they don't treat until it becomes greater than seven centimeters. That's the last that I heard. Um, and, and again, it depends on the patient. So if it's like a five centimeter aneurysm, then they might not treat until they, they just monitor it and make sure it doesn't get any bigger. And they try to do all the interventions to decrease risk factor so that it doesn't get any worse. This picture here just shows you some of the common areas. Again, this is the thoracic aorta. This is the abdominal aorta. And they can get aneurysms down in your peripheral areas as well. It's more common in your aorta. Of course, if these aneurysms, this weakening in the arterial wall would rupture, that would be a, an emergent situation. Usually, your, your aorta is pushing out a large amount of blood flow at a high pressure. So if this is, um, if this ruptures, then the patient will lose a lot of blood quickly. And so it's usually a hemorrhagic shock that's, that occurs, which would be um, evidenced by a drop, a sudden drop in a blood pressure, um, a sudden tachycardia, um, and the patient becoming lethargic quickly. That would be um, indicative of a hemorrhagic shock. Diagnosis of, a, of an aneurysm is a, it can be um, done accidental sometimes. A lot of times they'll be uh, maybe scanning a patient, like a CT scan is the standard tool for assessing the size and location of an of a aneurysm. What can happen is if somebody's getting scanned for another issue and they'll say, oh, did you know you had an aneurysm? Um, and then the, from there, they begin to look at and see the size and location and everything. And that's how they would monitor it. If it's just small and it's not causing any problems, they would do CT scans, um, usually like every six months, or if the patient's having any signs and symptoms, just to keep an eye on it. Repair of an aneurysm can be done if somebody does become symptomatic, um, or they begin to have, if the aneurysm gets bigger, then they could go in and do an elective surgery. And basically, they just put in a graft, which is kind of like a, just a wrap, um, where they kind of put um, 
like they kind of wrap the area to secure and just um, deliver like another uh, resource to to secure the aneurysm so that it doesn't rupture. There's a couple more um, arterial disorders that we want to talk about for module 10. Thromboangitis obliterin is also known as Berger's disease. This is, there's really no known cause for Berger's disease. It's thought to be um, possibly autoimmune. One of the major risk factors is thought to be smoking. Berger's disease is more common in men who smoke. And basically what it is, it's this um, claudication caused by inadequate blood supply. So they essentially have some damage to their vessel walls and it's not thought to be associated with atherosclerosis. It's thought to be um, associated with damage to the vessels resulting in fibrosis and scarring in the arteries. Um, and this, this causes pain. They have this intermittent claudication, especially with smoking. And um, it, the pain is ischemic pain. It's that kind of like that chest pain type thing that occurs in the digits. Um, so it's usually their, it's either their hands or their lower extremities. These patients have a sensitivity to cold and report coldness and numbness. Their pulses may be decreased in their distal extremities. Um, and their feet will be cool and red or cyanotic in a dependent position. So basically, they have a very similar signs and symptoms of peripheral arterial disease, but theirs is caused by um, a little bit different cause. So, you know, they might have a normal cholesterol level um, and maybe fairly young, actually, um, and no hypertension, but they have this signs and symptoms of some kind of a peripheral arterial disease. And if it's a young man who smokes, then um, they would encourage that patient to stop smoking and see if they can be, um, they can relieve some of the symptoms. Nursing interventions and Berger's disease is, is directed towards preventing the progression of the disease. So that's teaching them about not smoking. Um, and it says that a complete abstinence from tobacco in all forms is essential. So you have to remember your non um what is the smokeless tobacco? Um, again, you're going to, like, kind of like peripheral arterial disease, you're going to avoid vasoconstriction. So that means keep, stay out of the cold. Avoid prolonged um, exposure to cold. And they want to try to keep a warm environment to promote vasodilation. Here's some more, uh, again, just a summary of the clinical manifestation of Berger's disease is usually that claudication pain, that muscle pain caused by an inadequate blood supply. The pain may be ischemic and occurring in the digits. This is um, some arterial disease um, ulcers that can occur in a patient with Berger's. Um, it's the same arterial um, wounds that can occur with somebody with peripheral arterial disease as well. That black tissue that you're seeing is that dead tissue, and that's the areas that can get gangrenous. These are painful, um, and eventually, like that area will ex can it could extend if the blood supply isn't increased to the area and cause a loss of the entire toe and the tip of the finger here, just because that that dead tissue has to be removed or it'll get gangrenous. Sometimes medications can be used in the treatment of Berger's disease, um, and the medications are utilized to promote vasodilation. That could be Procardia, which is nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. And we know calcium channel blockers do cause some vasodilation. They are a peripheral vasodilator, so um, that could be effective in promoting blood supply in a patient with Berger's disease. Raynaud's phenomenon is um, somewhat similar to Berger's, uh, except for it is caused by vasospasms of arterioles and arteries of the upper and lower extremities. So it's not damage to them, it's just some vasospasming. And this is thought to be possibly autoimmune that causes it. It does. It is more common in women, um, and it's usually about um, 30 years and older. 
And it's usually, it's thought to be kind of associated, usually patients who have it have other autoimmune disorders as well. Um, but this vasospasming can cause like signs and symptoms of ischemia because it decreases the blood flow to the, um, to the periphery of it. This vasospasm, they constrict and it causes like a cyanosis. It's painful for the patient. Um, when it's relieved, and this is, this is, um, temporary. When the vasospasm is relieved, the tissue becomes red or hyperemic. So it's like, kind of like that feeling when you get a sudden return of blood flow to an area. They can, if it's, if they have frequent attacks of it, um, it can cause some damage over time. However, uh, they can manage it by simply doing some interventions. Um, again, we, they can take some calcium channel blockers that can cause vasodilation in order to um, help the blood flow and decrease the spasms. The other thing is they just need to stay out of the cold. Um, they should avoid, absolutely avoid prolonged exposure to the cold. Um, and, you know, so there are people who, if they are going to go out in the cold, they're going to want to buy, they're going to want to spend the money to buy the really nice gloves in order to keep their hands warm or the really nice boots to keep their lower extremities warm. Um, but they really, the best way is just to avoid prolonged exposure to extreme cold. They want to stay in a warm environment. And you may know somebody with Raynaud's. It seems to be a bit more um, common than Berger's disease. It's kind of an annoyance to most people that they can kind of manage um, without too much complication. But it's really, it's just when they're first diagnosed, they need some education on how to decrease the symptoms and the complications. This is just some pictures to show um, kind of what, ha what occurs here, the diminished blood flow here, the spasming can cause the decreased blood flow to the areas. Um, here's some of the top things they need to do in order to manage this, this disease is stop smoking, avoid caffeine, avoid medications that cause vasoconstriction, keep the body warm, avoiding exposure to cold, wearing mittens or gloves outdoors, and wearing comfortable roomy shoes with wool socks. The comfortable roomy shoes comes from making sure if they're too tight, then that's going to cause a restriction as well. So they need to just make sure that they have good fitting shoes, nice warm gloves if they're going to be out in the cold. We're just mentioning amputation in Module 10 due to the fact that amputation can be a treatment for an ischemic limb. So that's those, those um, ulcers that I showed you. If possibly a toe becomes um, necrosed, which is de that dead tissue due to the lack of blood supply, so an arterial ulcer that can occur possibly in a patient's toe may require that that toe be amputated so that they don't get gangrenous. So um, they can be elective or traumatic. In this case, what we're talking about for Module 10 is the elective amputation. Um, and most are, like I said, most are elective and related to complications of peripheral vascular disease and arterial sclerosis. Um, so the ischemic limb causes a death to tissue which needs to be removed so if it becomes gangrenous that gangrenous infection can actually spread to the rest of the body and the patient will die so that's why that area has to be amputated at times and it's considered only after it would be the last resort um, because certainly want to make sure that a patient um, keeps their limb but um, but sometimes they do have to it's the necrosis maybe the patient's non-compliant or things like that the amputation might have to occur, you know, in those, remember I said those acute um, peripheral arterial occlusions, maybe where that embolus comes and, and if it's not treated effectively and treated promptly, it could lead to tissue death, which could lead to an amputation. So it's important to um, make sure we treat those early. Post-procedure pain or post-procedure care for a patient with an amputation would certainly um, be related to their body image. Make sure that you help a patient get enough support to um, deal with any kind of body issues, body image issues that occur after an amputation. 
Um, and phantom limb pain is something that is uh, poorly understood and often undertreated. Just the main thing is to understand that phantom limb pain is usually due to the nerve endings um, of an area that was amputated and the patient, it is real pain. That's just the main thing to understand that phantom limb pain is real pain. They say I have pain in my foot and they've had their foot amputated. You know, you can't just say to them, oh, there is no foot there. You can't have pain in it. Well, they actually do. It's a sensation that they get um, that is often very difficult to deal with. Um, we can give them pain medication. It's often not a very effective. A lot of times it's doing other things like um, imagery, distraction, talking, supportive care are, are ways. some of the best ways to um, treat phantom limb pain. But the, the most important take home for the nurse is that phantom limb pain is real pain. You can't just blow it off and say you can't have pain there because they do and it's very, very painful at times. This concludes the presentation for part one of module 10. Um, I look forward to discussing these topics with you in class.